Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Well, welcome everybody to uh, Curious Crabs. Um, all you curious crabs out there, I'm not saying you're crabby, but it's an alliteration. Uh, we are going to be exploring uh, the world of some very interesting animals that live in some colder environments. And we are going to be, um, I'm in inviting you to share along with us today. So as we explore together and as we learn, if you have any questions or observations, uh, we invite you to contact us uh, by text and you can text us at the number on the screen, 562-286-1838. And we will be happy to include your um, your contributions during our program as we're teaching this live. Now, if you're watching this at a later time and you come up with some questions that you'd really like someone to answer, um, but we can't answer live on the air because our program is over, you can still text us, or I'm sorry, you can still email us at the email that's at the bottom of the screen. So at live at lbaop.org, and one of our educators will get back to you um, when we have a moment to reply to those. So let's go ahead and get started by bringing up a picture of an animal, um, because we are going to be talking about a type of mammal today. But I want to kind of review first and make sure we all are coming from the same place and we know what a mammal is. So we're going to start off by talking about any sort of mammal, what a mammal is. What are some mammal characteristics? You probably remember from learning this a long time ago, you'll notice this particular mammal is living in a pretty cold environment. This is one we're going to be focusing on today. Um, but why is this a mammal? What makes it a mammal? So think about those mammal characteristics. I actually have five in my mind that I'm thinking of that make mammals mammals. Do you remember what any of those are? If you are in a room with somebody, you can feel free to turn over and tell them and say, hey, I remember this, I remember this, I remember this, and maybe the other person can help you with the other two. Um, if you're in a room with a pet, you can talk to your pet. If you're just in a room by yourself, you can shout out to the screen, um, or of course, you can also text us. But as I'm looking at this particular animal, I'll move out of the way so you can see it a little bit better. Boy, how would you know that this is a mammal and not a bird? <laughs> well, it might be kind of hard to tell, but First of all, I notice up on the top, right up here, some little holes. What do you think those holes are for? Breathing. So the question is, what do mammals breathe? Mammals breathe air. They breathe air with lungs. So that is one mammal characteristic. So how they breathe is important. Um, what else is special about mammals? What do all other mammals have in common? They breathe air with lungs. Hmm. Well... Let's think about how they're born. Are mammals animals that hatch from eggs? Well, remember, we're mammals. Did you hatch from an egg? No, clearly not. Uh, we are born live. So mammals have live birth. And then the next question is, think about what do they give those babies after they give birth to them? So they give live birth and then those babies, what did you have as a baby? And I'm not talking about the jars of baby food. Before the baby food, what was the thing that you had, or should I say drank, when you were a baby? It's the same thing that every mammal drinks, milk. So mammals drink milk with mammary glands, and that's how they get the name mammal. So they breathe air, they give live birth, they feed their babies milk through mammary glands that comes from the parent. And then we have another picture here that might help us out. If you look at what is all covering, and I love this. This is one of our little babies that was born here at the aquarium, one of our baby seals. But you can see what is covering the whole entire body of our seal. Hmm, what is that? You probably have some on your head too. Yes, it is hair. So that is another mammal characteristic. So they have hair. And then why do they have hair? Well, in this particular animal, it might be helping it. We didn't notice it as much on the walrus, but why, what is another important characteristic of mammals? They have hair. It might be used if you have a lot of it to help you stay warm. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, they are warm blooded. So an animal that's warm blooded means that they have a constant body temperature that is not going to change with the temperature around them. So no matter how cold it might get outside, your body should still be the same temperature. It shouldn't go up and down with the environment. It should still be same 
the same. If you were to take your temperature, you'd find out, oh, my body temperature is not the same temperature as what's outside. It's the same internal body temperature. And that's what we call being warm-blooded. That's how we know if you're not feeling well, if you're sick. Um, we can test by taking a temperature. If you have a fever, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Obviously, it's a bad thing because our temperature, that means that our fever indicates that our temperature has gone above what is normal for us, and it shouldn't be going that high, and so that's not good. So those are mammal characteristics. Characteristics: Warm-blooded, have hair, breathe air, give live birth, and they feed uh, their babies milk. So all of those things are in common when we look at our walrus friend here. But now we're talking about marine mammals. Look at the surrounding. What do you see a lot of here? Obviously it's floating on a little bit of ice, but there's a lot of water. And so a marine mammal is quite simply a mammal that lives in or around the ocean. Now the marine mammals we are going to focus on are called pinnipeds. Now that might be a funny word. <laughs> Maybe you've never heard it before. I'm kind of curious if any of you have heard it before, but pinniped means feather-footed. And you might think, well, that's kind of a weird name or why would you call something feather-footed? But look at the foot, the so-called foot of this animal. It looks a lot different than our feet. Um, in fact, it looks a little bit more like a feather or a wing, doesn't it? Well, maybe not so much a feather, but a little bit more like, like a little wing in a way. So, and what do wings have? They have feathers. So it looks kind of like a feather foot if you use your imagination a little bit. We can't really see the ones back here because it's underwater. But we're going to be looking at pinnipeds, and pinnipeds refers to a group of animals. Do you know what group of animals? The walrus is one of them. Can you think of another one that's similar? We actually already saw a picture of it too. Are you thinking of a seal? You're correct if you're saying seal. But there's one other animal that's considered a pinniped that we haven't shown you yet. I'm kind of curious if anyone knows what it is. So a walrus, a seal, and what is the third one that might be considered a pinniped? Can you think of any other animal similar to a walrus or seal that moves around in a similar way that has like a, a feather foot? Um, not really with feathers, of course. And it uses it to help it swim because it is a marine mammal. So pinnipeds are all marine mammals. And I think I'm just going to wait for a second and see if anyone happens to know what it is besides a seal or a walrus. So as I'm letting you think about that and giving you a chance to respond because we have a little bit of a delay, um, I want you to make some other interesting observations about this particular animal. What stands out to you about the walrus? We know it has the sort of flippers, that feather foot right there. We know it has a nose for breathing right up there. But what else? What are those other obvious things that stand out to you about this animal? How would you describe this animal? We mentioned that it is a mammal and mammals have a constant body temperature which means they have to be able to keep themselves warm in some way in a cold environment. What do you think this walrus has to help it stay warm? One thing I notice is I don't see a lot of obvious hair on this animal. Now, believe it or not, they do have hair. It might not be as obvious, um, but they do have some matted down hair there. And also some animals like whales and dolphins, which have hair too, they don't always keep all of that hair. It's not always obvious for all of their lives. They might only have it for a short time in their lives when they're first born and then it falls out later. So even though it might not look very obvious, this animal does have hair, but it has some other interesting things. Did you notice the same things I'm noticing? I think the most obvious thing about the walrus is probably right over here. <laughs> it has tusks. Now walruses have tusks and it doesn't matter if it's a male or a female. Both male and females have tusks, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, now this one looks a little bit shorter than the one that we saw before, so they might be at different stages of development. Some might have bigger tusks than others, but of course, oh, and look at this one. This one has much longer tusks. The question is, what do you think they use their tusks for? What is the purpose of them? They must have some purpose. They must help this animal in some way. Can you think of any reasons why having a tusk might be useful to this particular animal? If you have any ideas, let us know. You can text us at 562-286-1838.
If you're watching this at a later time, you can go ahead and text in any questions you have. You can share your observations too. Uh, but again, if you have any questions and we will respond to those. So looking again at the environment, look at where this walrus is living. It's obviously living in a cold area. Now, the cold area that it lives in, we refer to as the Arctic. Do you know where the Arctic is? Uh, if you said North Pole, you're right. <laughs> the Arctic is what's at the top of our planet. We think about the North Pole, we think about the South Pole, we might think they're pretty similar habitats. And while they do have some similarities, and it generally is the coldest place on our planet up at the poles where we get the least amount of sunlight or the furthest away from the sun, well, it also is a little bit different. And we don't necessarily have walruses in the South Pole. That's the Antarctic. So they're really polar opposites, the North Pole and the South Pole. The North Pole actually has a whole bunch of water that's surrounded by land. And that water turns to freezing ice like you see right here. The South Pole, where Antarctica is, Antarctica is actually land. And then it's got this big area of water around it. So it's quite opposite, even though both of them are very, very cold. And you're going to see a lot of ice in the water nearby. Well, that's a totally comfortable environment for the walrus because it has all this great protection keeping it warm. Have you figured out what it is that's keeping this, this walrus warm? Well, Ms. Let's see, McCulloch's. Okay, Ms. Mrs. McCulloch's class, Emily says defense and to break up ice. Emily, yes, you're absolutely right. If you're talking about what the walrus is using to, or how it's using its tusks, you're absolutely right. Those are the two main things it uses it for. It uses it for defense. It can protect itself. Um, it can use it to battle other walruses if it needs to or anything else trying to hurt it. But it can also use it to help it get up on ice too. Think about getting that big, thick, fat body out of the water and up onto that ice. Boy, that could be a little hard. They also will use their tusks to help them get up out of the ice and to break it up. And not only to break up the ice, but to also help them search for their food in the bottom of the ocean. So while they do sit on the top, they sit on ice like you see right here, and boy, it's amazing. Look at how much ice can support all those walruses. Think about all of that weight <laughs> that that ice is supporting. Any ideas as to how heavy a walrus is? They look a little bit heavier than me. <laughs> well, they can be about 3,000 pounds. 3,000 pounds each. That is a lot. Oops, our, our connection is a little bit freezing right now. It's a little spotty. Maybe I'll stay off. Hopefully you can hear me okay. But let's go ahead and look at all those walruses. Do you see that they all have tusks? Do those tusks look like they're different in sizes? I'm definitely noticing some have much shorter ones and some have longer ones. I'm guessing that maybe the ones with the shorter ones, maybe those are the younger ones. Those are the babies probably just growing their tusks. But these are, there are two different species of walruses. They both live in the Arctic. So they live in the Northern hemisphere. And like I said, both males and females have the tusks and they can get up to seven and a half feet to 11 and a half feet long. So that's a lot bigger than me too. So those are big. <laughs> Those are very, very big animals. And that ice is obviously supporting a lot of weight with all of those large, large animals on it. But the reason they're so large, a lot of their body actually has to do with how they're staying warm. What are they using to stay warm? Well, it's blubber. So you may have noticed the class, this class is called blubber beasts. This one is definitely a blubber beast. It is just covered in blubber. You're like, wait a minute, what is blubber? Well, blubber is that big, special, thick layer of fat. So we don't have it, we have fat, but they have a special kind of fat called blubber that is really, really thick and is really, really great at keeping them warm. So that's what they are relying on to keep them warm. And I would say that this particular walrus, it looks like it's staying pretty warm with all of that blubber. You can see all those rows. And also look right here. Can you kind of see this one has been a little bit out of the water for a while, kind of dry.
Can you see those hairs? Look carefully. You can actually see the texture to wear its hair. So even though it looks like it's just a whole bunch of dark skin, those are actually really fine hairs because they do have hair, but that hair is not keeping them warm. <laughs> it's too short for that, but they are relying on that blubber instead to keep them warm. And a good thing about blubber is it helps them to float a little bit better, probably. Uh, I'm guessing because regular fat helps you float. So I would think that blubber might help you float a little bit too. But those animals are all pretty heavy. So I guess I don't really know for sure. <laughs> but this is one type of pinniped. Now we mentioned earlier seals and we mentioned walruses both being pinnipeds. Did you ever figure out what other animal might be a pinniped? I'm going to give you a quick glance. We're going to bring up one of our other animals and we'll see if you recognize what this one is. Ah, now maybe you were thinking it's a seal, but this one is actually not a seal. This is our third pinniped and it is called a sea lion. And I want you to pay special note to this right here. Special attention to this little thing right here. What do you think that is? because it's a little bit different than how our other pinniped friends look. So what do you think that thing was? Right here on this part of its body, right on the side. Oh, here's another great picture. Looks like it's got two of them, these two things sticking out of its head. What are those things? <laughs> because I didn't notice it on our walrus. I didn't notice it on the seals either. So walruses and seals do not have these things sticking out the side of their heads. In fact, maybe we can even see, I don't know if we have a good picture that's close enough to um, kind of zoom in on that area of a seal or a sea lion. My <laughs> I'm making my friend Cynthia work a little bit. Cynthia is on the other side of the camera. She's controlling the things that you're seeing on the screen behind me. And I actually don't know if we have a really good picture for what I'm looking for, but she's going to look for me and see if we have one. But have you figured out what they could be? What could be those two things sticking out on the side of that animal's head? And what would they help it to do? Because all animals have these. I can't think of any animal that doesn't have these. In fact, or any mammal, certainly all mammals have these. But they don't look the same. Here's a close-up view. And I want you to look at the side of the seal's head. Do you see that right there? It's got a hole. So it has a hole there. It doesn't have anything sticking out of it like our sea lion did. So what do you think that is? Well, if you put your hands to the side of your head, you can feel your little ear flaps sticking out. You can feel your ears. That's what those are. So sea lions have outer ear flaps, just like we do. You can hold onto your ears. You can pull them. Seals and walruses do not have those outer ear flaps. Instead, they do have ears, but their ears are just holes on the side of their head. So that's one of the ways that you can tell these different pinnipeds apart, because sometimes people do get an animal like a seal mixed up with a sea lion. And sea lions are what we call eared seals. Even though all seals have ears, but they're more internal with these little holes. Um, but sea lions have those outer ear flaps that stick out. So what did you notice on our walrus? Let's look again at our walrus and see, does it have those ear flaps sticking out? Do we notice where the ears are on it? Well, I see its eyes. I see eyes here, but I actually don't see anything sticking out the side. Oh, what about this one? Look at how clear it is now. Now you can see it pretty well. This is a nice ear. So it doesn't stick out, but it's a little hole in the side of its head. So it still has the ability to hear, but it helps us identify that, oh, this is a different type of animal than a sea lion. But there are some other body similarities, and both of them rely heavily on blubber to help them keep warm. But did you know the walrus is not the only really large pinniped in the Arctic? There is another very big blubber beast that lives, that's even bigger than a sea lion that lives in the Arctic and in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm wondering if any of you have any ideas what it could be. I'm gonna have my friend Cynthia pull up a picture and see if you can tell me what this animal is. So it's kind of similar in size to the walrus, but there's two different subspecies of walruses, the Atlantic and the Pacific, and they get like maximum size, 3,000 pounds. But this animal I'm going to show you, it's the largest seal in, north, in the Northern Hemisphere. They can get 13 feet long, 
versus the 11 and a half feet of a walrus. And they can get 4,400 pounds. That's really big. And this is the one. Now, this one may not win any beauty contests, but if you look at it, it kind of gives away. If you, if you think creatively, can you come up with a good name for that particular animal? What would you call it? If you had an animal that had this big thing, we actually call it a proboscis, this big thing on top of its head, kind of hanging down over its mouth, what other animals can you think of that have this big long thing hanging down over the front of their mouth, kind of like a trunk? Well, if you were thinking of an elephant, <laughs> that's what the scientists were thinking of too when they named this particular seal. They call this an elephant seal because of that long proboscis that it has. You can see it sticking out over there. But now look at this one. This one doesn't have it. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, this one is a baby, and the babies haven't developed that big, long proboscis yet. And the other one right here is a female. The females don't get that long snout either. And Mrs. McCulloch's class said, how is their hearing? Oh, I'm glad you asked. They actually have very good hearing too, which is important for them because they make a lot of noise. <laughs> they will, if you look at a group of seals like this, of elephant seals, they actually make a clucking noise that kind of sounds like a bunch of chickens sometimes. Um, if you happen to live anywhere close, and I realize many of you probably do not, um, but I had the opportunity to visit and work at um, a marine mammal care center where we would take care of elephant seals. And you can go visit um, care centers or a place that might have elephant seals. Um, you could go to a place where they are naturally found along the coast of California. Um, but you should listen to them because they are very noisy animals. They make a lot of noises and the... Um, adult males that get really, really big, when they start to um, compete with each other for other females, they actually make this really weird, loud sort of clicking and weird noises. I don't know. You should look it up if you get a chance. Uh, Google it, uh, the noises of elephant seals. So they do make some pretty interesting noises. And so they have those ears, even though they're not obvious to us, but they do have them right around here those holes in the sides of their heads that do actually help them hear pretty well. So these are elephant seals. Again, do you see the fur on their body or the hair? It almost looks like they're just hairless, but they're not hairless. These are really, really fine, small hairs. And it looks like this one is actually molting. So it's going through a sort of catastrophic molt where it just loses all of these um, layers, a little bit even of the skin and the hair all at one time. So it leaves these funny looking patches on their bodies. So again, not always the prettiest looking animals, but pretty interesting. Now here's a whole bunch of them. Looks like it's a rainy day, but look at how they all pile up on top of each other. Look at all those wrinkles in their body too as they're moving around and looking at each other. It looks like those two are probably making noises. Then we've got a bunch of sleeping ones and someone who's very excited to have the opportunity to see them. Look at that again. There's so many of them. They are very social animals. Now, if you look at those bodies, now these are females or young ones. So you don't see um, any adult males in here with those big, long um, proboscises. I guess you would say it. Um, they don't have a proboscis. Um, but these animals, the males can dive and hold their breath underwater for 60 minutes. So I believe that is the deepest or the longest diving uh, pinniped that there is. They can hold their breath for up to 60 minutes. Now, females use, usually hold their breath for like 20 minutes. So they don't go and stay under quite as long as the males do. Uh, but again, very deep divers. Uh, they can dive as deep as ooh, 5,000 feet. So over 5,000 feet deep. Think about all the pressure that would be on their body. That's pretty amazing. Um, but fortunately, they're staying warm when they dive deep in those cold waters because of all that blubber. So I love the fact that we get to see all of these animals. I don't know if any of you have ever seen them um, in person yourself, uh, but definitely something worth looking at online. Now, if you look at how, um, how big they can get, you think about all this blubber, what is a thing that might be contributing to blubber? Do you think that maybe the amount of food they eat could contribute to that? 
Well, it does. So think about what types of food. Do you have any idea what an elephant seal or a walrus might like to eat? I don't think we even really talked about that really with the walruses. We said that they do use those tusks for digging things up from the ocean floor. So for a walrus, they eat a lot of things in the floor of the ocean. They don't necessarily have to dive quite as deep as the elephant seals do when they're looking for their, their food. But the, um, the walrus here can feed on clams, um, all sorts of different mollusks like mussels and clams. Um, they might even slurp up some worms and snails, so other things with hard shells and shrimp. And what I learned today is they will even eat sea cucumbers, which really surprised me. Do you know what sea cucumbers are? They're very interesting invertebrates. So another animal that doesn't have a backbone. I mean, it has a very squishy body. In fact, sometimes people eat them too. Last time I was at Costco, I found out you could get a bag of sea cucumbers. It was very expensive and it wasn't exactly on my um, menu list, um, not my preferred choice of food, but there are people that eat sea cucumbers just like walruses do. Um, I'm sure that people prepare them in a very different way than the walrus, but I think the walrus will probably just slurp them on up using these big, like that sort of muzzle area. It's like this big sort of soft thing with these very, very stiff hairs that are a special type of hair called vibrissae, or vibrissae are like the whiskers. And they might use those to dig around in the murky water. They're very, very sensitive to, so they can feel where things are. And it might help them to uncover an animal like this sea cucumber. Now, does that look like a cucumber that you would have um, in your salad? Is that the type of sea cucumber? <laughs> No, this is not a vegetable, it is an animal. But this is one of the things that walruses will also eat. Well, elephant seals will eat things like lanternfish, hake, squid, skates, rays, like yes, even stingrays, octopus, eels, even small sharks, and then other large fish. So they have an appetite of a lot of really, um, some bigger things. And you can see the, again, big, long body. Oh, and this is great. You can see those back flippers that they use to help them swim. So they have a big body. And fortunately, it's kind of a hydrodynamic shape to help them get through the water a little bit easier. But they rely on those back flippers to help them move through the water. If you remember when we were talking about the other pinniped, the sea lion, they have really large front flippers that they use for pushing themselves through the water. That's another difference between um, a sea lion and a seal. Seals rely on their back flippers to help them swim. But they can use those to dive deep and find all those cool fish living in the ocean that they can then prey on. And the more they're eating, the more blubber they're going to get to help keep them warm in that really, really cold environment. Now, we've been talking about blubber and these blubbery beasts. Well, if you want to, you're kind of wondering, well, how does blubber really help keep an animal warm? You can actually make a blubber glove for yourself. Now, I'm not talking about a glove that you probably want to wear out. You probably don't want to wear it to school. It might get your hands kind of messy. But there's actually some instructions on our website. If you go to our winter, or maybe not our winter kids club, but on the link that you join to watch this program today, there will also be a link that will uh, show you our craft. And our craft is to develop a blubber glove. Now you might think, what is a blubber glove? Well, we're actually not getting real blubber from a seal or a walrus, but the same sort of stuff, the blubber is very similar to Crisco or um, shortening, I should say, shortening. I think we use Crisco for this. Uh, so shortening or even butter, if you don't have shortening around. You could take some of that and put it into some bags and make a little blubber glove. So you can put your hand, and again, you're not putting it straight into the mushy stuff. You would have it in a bag and then you put your hand between the bags. And then if you were to put that in a bucket of ice or ice water, you would notice that your hand actually stays pretty warm. Believe it or not, that blubber does a good job of keeping you warm, even in a very cold environment, which is basically how these animals survive with their blubber, keeping them warm in those cold Arctic waters with all the ice around them. So, and if you don't have a whole lot of shortening or butter at home that your parents are like, I don't think I want you to use up all of that. I need to do some baking. Don't use it all up on a glove. That's okay. You can make a small amount for just your finger if you want. You can try a, a small little sample. 
So anyhow, you can find the instructions to make a blubber glove like this on our website. And if you happen to make a blubber glove, you get a chance to show yourself trying it out. Um, go ahead and do a, use a hashtag, hashtag AOP Kids Club, um, and share that with us because we would love to see it. Um, and also, if there are any teachers who are watching this with your classes, I know we have one, um, if you wouldn't mind doing us a favor and just sending in the numbers of how many kids were watching uh, this program, we would love to know just for our own records. Um, but we hope you had a fun time exploring blubber beasts with us today and enjoy the rest of your winter and happy new year, everyone. Bye.